Experiencing Utah, we like to look at using different kinds of devotionals to inspire us and to help us to develop and become more like Jesus, but also to discover things and to uncover in ourselves areas we need to grow. Maybe places and things that we hadn't thought of, ways and means that maybe we haven't employed in examining ourselves, to finding if we're in the faith or if we're straying a little bit, if we're having what some people call leakage, you know, where we're not a vessel that is filled, but we have cracks, you know, things are beginning to crack and to kind of like, you know, not hold in some of that precious experiences of life that God has taken us from where we were to where we are today. And he's allowed us by his Holy Spirit to know things that we should be filled with love and experience the joy and the knowledge of God and how he works things through grace and mercy to those around us by possibly making us to sit down and examine ourselves and say, where are we at today? Maybe we need to be a little more serious about our personal life as opposed to our public life. Now, I don't know about you, but you know, I'm, I try to be as much in my personal life as the same as I am in my public life. But you know as well as I do that in your private life, you're different than you are in your personal life. That you probably do things that you don't want to talk about, you know, in your personal private life that maybe you don't do in your public life. We know what we're talking about. But also likewise, you know, in your business life where you do those things that you need to accomplish the job, you put on, you know, a, a persona sometimes that your personality may not be the same as you are with, say, your church life or your religious life or the life that you have with your wife or your children or alone with your boyfriend or girlfriend or whoever it may be. You may be this kaleidoscope of different personality types based upon the people that you're around or the people you deal with. You may reflect at times some of what they're doing or you may object at times some of what you see them doing. A lot of times we're affected by our environment rather than we who are able to be salt and light affect the environment around us. You see, salt, no matter how you look at it, whether it's a lot or a little, is going to affect anything that it's placed in. It's going to taste salty or it's going to cause a breakdown of things like in snow. It's going to cause some kind of reaction. It is almost like a catalyst. So once you put it into something, it's going to cause an effect. The same thing is true about light, is that wherever light is, it's going to cause some kind of effect. Light can generate electricity, light can produce growth, light can cause darkness to flee, light can do a lot of things. Jesus used those analogies and those similes and metaphors to demonstrate to us what we are like, or what we are supposed to be like. And that's why we examine ourselves sometimes in experiencing God using devotionals like this in order to question ourselves, to look at ourselves and to examine ourselves to see how we might better develop or be saltier or be more like the light that we come from. To be more like Jesus, to experience God in a deeper and more intimate way, but also perhaps to grow in the knowledge of him in a way that we might not have tried before. So when I read experiencing God day by day, I kind of am challenged in ways I don't normally challenge myself. I look at it and I ponder it and I think about what I can make real as a part of my life, as I can apply it to who I am. In this one, <laughs> painful reminders. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Acts 14, 19. God has many ways to deter us from sin. One is to provide reminders for us so that we may never take disobedience to him lightly. Before his conversion, Paul assumed that he was righteous before God. In reality, Paul was so disoriented to God that he arrested and executed Christians in order to please God. Paul was so blinded to God's will that he watched Stephen being brutally murdered for his faith. Paul's heart was hardened, and he became even more determined to imprison other Christians. 
It is significant that there are two occurrences of stoning mentioned in the New Testament, Stephen's and Paul's. Was it coincidence that God allowed Paul to be stoned in the same manner as Stephen had been? God had certainly forgiven Paul for his involvement in Stephen's death, but God also left him with a reminder of what his arrogance had led him to do. If pride could blind Paul to God once, pride could do it again. Perhaps Paul's thorn in the flesh was a direct result of this stoning. It may have served as a visual or visible reminder to Paul and to others of the terrible consequence of sin. God is absolutely just. He loves and he forgives, but he does not compromise. He doesn't compromise his righteousness nor his holiness. God deals with us uniquely. He draws upon our experiences to teach us about himself. God will forgive us our sins, but he may provide stark reminders of the ugliness of sin. Let us thank God that he loves us enough to remind us of the destructive consequences of sin in our lives without making us pay the full penalty for sin of our lives. You know, I like that. I am often reminded by my own sinfulness because I sin every day. I mean, much as I'd like to say I don't, I'd love to say that the soul that sins shall surely die, and I'd love to say that, you know, um, I was trying to think of the one that says that, you know, if you be in Christ, you sin not. You know, in First John, I can't think of it right now off the top of my head, but if I'm honest, in some ways, in some persona or some consequence or some reality check, if I'm looking at myself, I say, yeah, left alone to myself, I do sin. If I, if I consider, you know, like the, the world I live in, if I'm walking down the street and I see someone that, you know, is obviously, you know, underdressed or well-dressed or whatever it may be, I may think, well, you know, I'd like to have a suit like that. You know, I may lust after their clothes or someone who has less clothes, I may think, wow, and lust after that. <laughs> I'm a man after all. But I don't have to give in to sin, even though I may sin or transgress, as the word may be, or trespass, as the word may apply, to that with which I do at times in my life. Now, if I go on with that transgression, it could lead to sin. If I trespass and I go on with that, it could lead to transgression and lead to sin. There are different aspects of that with which we are still sinful nature. It does apply. We war against our flesh and the flesh against our spirit. But there's also times that I just flat out sin because I am a sinner. You know, I'll get mad at somebody and I'll, I'll sin. I might say something I'll regret later. I might do something I'll regret later and I have to pay the consequence of it. And I see the ugliness that I don't like it. Paul said it himself in the way of crying out to God, The good that I would, I do not, and that which I would not, I do. O wretched man, who can deliver me from this body of sin that I live in? And it was that next chapter, Praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ, who has you know, brought to us salvation, so that we no longer account to ourselves the way that we could possibly condemn ourselves, that God has imputed to us his righteousness without it being accountable for every day our sinfulness that we need to confess we need to profess that yes we are sinners every day by the day by the time that the day is ended i can say in some way that yes i have sinned and i have fallen short of the glory of god and at the same time confess my sins to him and ask him to forgive me and to cleanse me from all righteousness or at least i try <laughs> Yeah, I'm human. I'll be honest with you. You know, there are days that, hey, I may let it slide, just like anyone else. I'm human. But because God is making me more than human, but he's making me divine, I am changing from this incorruption, from this corruption into incorruption. That this mortality is putting on immortality. That this nature with which was once ruling is now subservient to the choices that I make that I don't have to sin, that I can choose to walk with him in such a way that I no longer need to be led by my sin, but I could lead sin captive in my life and remove it to God's control and let him deal with it and remove it far from me by taking out of me the nature and the corruption that has happened to this physical body that one day has to perish because it's already been corrupted. 
it's already been put in such a way and deviant from what God intended it to be that no matter what I do to this body, this flesh is corrupt. And it cannot go to a place of immortality where there is no corruption. So once my flesh puts on that incorruptible vessel that God has made for me, which is a spiritual body, then it is equipped for the universe with incorruption. And so I look forward to that time that until then, I do need to examine myself and find when I am in sin to repent, to choose to not do what I just did and go a different way, to choose a better way of life, a more excellent way of living, an uh, opportunity to experience God in a more intimate way that when the reality of those things that I see, I touch, I feel, or I experience in this world fall short of the glory I see when I look up and I experience God in Utah today. I can look up to the mountains and I can say, hey, and they're beckoning me, you know, they're calling unto me, they want me to come climb. But if I go up into those mountains and it takes me all day and I'm not prepared for the night, I could freeze to death, even though it looks so easy in my sight. The same thing is true in life. Things that look like we can handle, whether it be our little sin or our big sin, we really can't do it, but we can commit it unto God, who from the beginning unto the end will perfect that which concerns us. For that with which we have committed unto him, he will perfect unto the day of salvation, even unto the day of Jesus Christ, when we are brought into the unity of the body of believers, and we become one faith, one bride, one family, one perfection in the sight of God, one holiness, one righteousness, which has been given to us, not because of what we've done, but because of who we've trusted in and what we know he can do for us. And by grace, we've been saved for that reason, that we can experience God today in Utah, that we can experience Utah in such a way that we can enjoy the land we occupy knowing that this is not our home, but we can enjoy the fruits of the labor that God gives us each day to do. And we can participate in the salvation of those that live around us while we experience God in a new way, a unique way, a distinctive way that he's caused us and placed us here in Utah today to do that which he wants done, not what we want to do, which might lead us to do something we ought not to do, which just might be sin. Again, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I am thrilled today to say that because every day I know I'm a sinner saved by grace.